Greetings, Internet people. Today we're taking a look at the events of the 1960s, covering what went down during JFK and LBJ's administration. If you're studying for A-Push, those are some of the books and how this video lines up to them. So we're going to start off with JFK. And remember the election of 1960, Kennedy's running against the Vice President, Richard Nixon. And this is an important election because it's the first time candidates face off on television in a series of debates. And most people say Kennedy wins the television debate. He looks good, he has a swagger to him, whereas Nixon is pale and pasty and has the five o'clock shadow. So this begins the transformation of American politics and TV's role in it. Kennedy is the first Catholic president elected. Remember in 1928, we saw Al Smith running and that issue really kind of played a key role in the election. Kennedy breaks through that barrier and becomes the first Catholic president. Kennedy runs on a domestic program known as the New Frontier, and really he wants federal money to education, health care, programs, civil rights, and etc. But he doesn't really have a decisive win. He only wins by a little more than 100,000 votes over Nixon, so he's going to be limited in what he's going to be able to accomplish domestically. In fact, most of his domestic agenda will be blocked by Congress and overshadowed by concerns over foreign affairs. He is going to openly call on the nation to be the first to put a man on the moon. He gives a really passionate speech. And, you know, during Kennedy's administration, the space race is going to continue. Billions of dollars will be spent. This will help the economy. And in 1969, the United States will be the first country to put a man on the moon. Kennedy also creates the Peace Corps, which is created to send Americans to underdeveloped countries to help out. Now, the Cold War continues under Kennedy. It's going to be a reality of life under JFK. The new Soviet leader during his administration is Nikita Khrushchev, and those two men are going to be competing for influence around the world. Kennedy does oversee, in 1961, the creation of the Alliance for Progress. It's an economic development program for Latin America. You know, some people call it the Marshall Plan for Latin America. It has limited results. Big important event is the Bay of Pigs invasion in Latin America. JFK approves of his CIA plan that was actually planned under President Eisenhower's administration in which the U.S., the CIA, would train Cuban exiles to overthrow the Castro government. They would land at the Bay of Pigs and the hope would be that the Cuban people would rise up and remove Castro. The invasion is a complete failure as the Cuban exiles land in the Bay of Pigs in 1961 and no uprising comes to their support. In fact, Castro easily crushes the rebellion. It's a huge embarrassment for JFK. It blows up in his face. And since the U.S. does not send support, the invasion was doomed to failure. And as a result of the Bay of Pigs invasion, Castro and Khrushchev, the Cubans and the Soviets, move closer together. In a completely unrelated event, the Soviet Union begins construction of the Berlin Wall in East Germany. Um, in 1961 and the really the goal of the Berlin Wall is to keep East Germans from fleeing to West and you could see Kennedy visiting the Berlin the West Berlin side of that wall and pledging US support for West Berlin a really big moment of Kennedy's presidency is the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 in October US U-2 spy planes discover that the Soviets were installing offensive nuclear weapons inside of Cuba. These weapons were capable of hitting most American cities and could kill millions of Americans in minutes. And you can see on the map some of those cities and times. Kennedy orders a naval blockade of Cuba. He calls it a quarantine because a blockade is technically an act of war and he's trying to pressure the Soviets to remove the missiles. This is a very tense situation and it's the closest that the two sides ever came to a potential nuclear war. Kennedy and Khrushchev are in a tense standoff. There's all sorts of what-ifs in this situation. What if the Soviets run the blockade? Would the U.S. shoot and engage in battle? The advisors of JFK overwhelmingly were telling him to attack before the missiles become operational. We now know that those missiles were already operational, and if Kennedy would have attacked, it could have been really, really bad. Khrushchev eventually, after a tense standoff, agrees to remove the missiles, and a couple of things are reached in a deal. Kennedy promises that we will not try to invade Cuba, and the U.S. would later on, six months later, remove missiles, U.S. missiles from Turkey that were pointed at the Soviet Union's. The impact of the Cuban Missile Crisis, they install a hotline between D.C. and Moscow so that we can communicate instantly to try to prevent a future crisis. 
and it increases calls for relaxing of tensions, detente. In fact, a nuclear test ban treaty where no atmospheric testing is proposed by Kennedy. Keep in mind, during the Cold War, the arms race is going to continue. Even though Eisenhower warned of the military-industrial complex, Kennedy is going to continue the arms race. But there's going to be some differences. The Kennedy administration moved away from the Dulles idea of massive retaliation and the New Look policy, which relied on nuclear weapons. In fact, the problem was nuclear weapons could not be used in smaller conflicts in countries such as Vietnam or Laos. If there's these small little brush fires, you really can't use a nuclear bomb. So Kennedy and his defense secretary, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, very important guy you can see right there, they proposed an idea called flexible response. This basically said we would increase our spending on conventional weapons and maintain a variety of options. So if there's a situation where the Soviets are providing weapons or money or trading, we would be able to go in and help out our side with these variety of options. Kennedy does call for the creation of the Green Berets, a highly trained special forces unit, and defense spending continues to rise under Kennedy. This is a part of the Cold War. Kennedy's administration is going to be cut short, unfortunately, when he is assassinated in Dallas in November of 1963 by Lee Harvey Oswald. There's the gun that was used. Following Kennedy's assassination, his vice president from Texas, Lyndon Baines Johnson, becomes the president. There he is taking the oath of office aboard Air Force One. And Johnson's an interesting character. He's a New Deal Democrat. He's been around for 30 year member of Congress, and he really wants to expand the reforms of the New Deal and use the power of the federal government to create change. In fact, Lyndon Johnson's domestic program was called the Great Society, and it would dramatically increase the size and the scope of the federal government. But unlike the New Deal, the Great Society will seek to advance the cause of civil rights. Very important thing to know. Some of the key areas of reform for Lyndon Johnson are going to be in the area of immigration reform, civil rights, education funding, and medical help for the elderly. So we'll take a look at how those goals were achieved under Johnson's administration. Really important you know about the Great Society. One of the key aspects of it was the war on poverty. In fact, Michael Harrington's book called The Other America turned the nation's attention on the 40 million people living in poverty in America. In fact, Johnson, one of the first things he does is he declares an unconditional war on poverty. Congress created the Office of Economic Opportunity, which was an anti-poverty agency, and a variety of programs are going to be established. One of those is the Head Start program, which would provide free preschooling for poor, low-income individuals, Job Corps, which would give vocational education to those people to lift them up out of poverty, literacy and legal programs are created, and the biggie, really not connected to poverty, though, is the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. There's Johnson signing it over there by the Statue of Liberty. This ends the quotas of the 1920s, remember the quota of 1921, the quota of 1924, it ended the quotas designed to restrict certain nationalities. And following the Immigration Act of 1965, you get a huge increase of immigrants from Latin America, Asia, and other countries. Johnson runs for re-election in 1964, and he runs with a clear liberal agenda. He wants to increase the welfare state, increase the size of the federal government. It's important to know that Republicans, though, do not like this. They didn't like it under the New Deal, and they don't like it under Johnson. And they turn to the conservative senator, Barry Goldwater from Arizona. He wants to end the welfare state. He wants to balance the budget. He does not like programs like Social Security or the TVA or any of these other great society new programs that are being proposed. And Johnson wins in a landslide victory. But it's important to keep in mind, new conservative leaders are emerging in this period of the 1960s. They don't like the programs of the New Deal or Great Society, and you're going to have a conservative reaction coming. 1968, Nixon's going to get elected, and during the election of 64, people like Ronald Reagan start coming up and making a name for themselves. However, for Johnson, he has something that Truman did not have. He has the presidency, and the Democrats control Congress. So now he has the power to create change. 
And Johnson's going to do that with a variety of great society programs. So here are just a few highlights. You can't cover them all. Medicare is around today. It gives health care for those people over the age of 65. Medicaid, health care for the poor and the disabled. Food stamp programs, federal money for the arts, public housing, regulation of the auto industry, and a whole bunch of other federal programs are created during President Johnson's administration. Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, really shocked the nation when it exposed the use of pesticides and how DDT was destroying wildlife in 1962, and it helps stimulate interest and leads to the creation of the Clear Air and Water Acts under the Great Society. And once again, the Great Society expands the welfare state to provide assistance to those previously ignored, the poor, the disabled, the elderly, and civil rights. It kind of continues what the New Deal was trying to do in a much bigger and broader way. However, there are lots of critics to the Great Society, and it's important you know those. Many people, especially Republicans and conservatives, felt these programs were too costly inefficient, too idealistic, you can't really fix some of these problems, and they created a dependency. So you're going to see a reaction to the Great Society from those individuals. Another important thing to keep in mind is the Civil Rights Movement. Under Kennedy, though, progress was slow on the issue of civil rights. He did not win with a large victory in 1960, so Kennedy, just like Roosevelt was, was hesitant to really push the issue on a national stage. However, grassroots movements keep the pressure up for change. We saw the sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina. There's the Freedom Rides, where the Congress of Racial Equality, members of CORE, try to end segregation in bus facilities by traveling through the South to bring attention to the issue. These individuals were oftentimes met by violence. You could see one of the Freedom Ride buses being firebombed by racist individuals. In spite of this, the movement continued. You have JFK eventually sending troops to allow James Meredith to register at the University of Mississippi. Keep in mind, James Meredith is an Air Force veteran. The federal court said he could attend the university, and protesters try to keep him out. Kennedy sends in the troops to allow James Meredith to attend Old Miss. You have Martin Luther King and other civil rights activists were thrown in jail during protests in Birmingham, Alabama. Alabama was an area of extreme segregation and lack of black voting taking place and so people like King and other ordinary individuals are using nonviolent protests as you could see in the image um, to bring attention to this issue. King writes the very famous letter from a Birmingham jail in which he talks about nonviolence and the need for civil disobedience. In 1963 you get a Extremely important moment where you have the March on Washington of over 200,000 white, black, and other civil rights um, activists. And it is at this place where King gives his I Have a Dream speech. Following the assassination of Kennedy, you have really kind of momentum picking up for the civil rights movement. President Johnson, along with Congress, signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There's Johnson shaking hands with King, and really what it does is segregation is illegal in all public facilities, and it established the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. This banned discrimination in employment, everything from race, religion, sex, and national origin discrimination. And the Civil Rights Act of 1964 allows the federal government the power to enforce desegregation in all different areas of life. However, the civil rights movement still had a really key area to focus on, and that is the right to vote. There was a lack of voting rights and it remained a major problem in many southern states. The 24th Amendment was passed and ratified, which outlawed the collection of poll taxes, which was a common device used to disenfranchise African American voters. During the Freedom Summer of 1964, there's a huge voter registration drive in Mississippi. In Mississippi, only 5% of eligible blacks were registered to vote, and during the Freedom Summer, you have civil rights activists suddenly going missing. In 1965, you have the very famous march from Selma to Montgomery, and they're trying to bring attention to the issue of voting rights, and local law enforcement stops this peaceful, nonviolent protest with violence. You can see in those images right there. LBJ does send in federal troops to protect the nonviolent civil rights protesters, and the big moment comes with the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which ended efforts to prevent African Americans from voting in the South. For example, literacy tests 
are banned. With the Voting Rights Act, you see black people voting in the Deep South in large numbers for the first time since Reconstruction. This is a huge transformation of Southern politics. In spite of this, though, there was a growing frustration with the slow pace of change. In fact, not too long after the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed, you have radicalization of the civil rights movement. In fact, in 1965, the Watts riots break out in Los Angeles following an arrest of a black motorist by white police officers. The riots last for six days. 34 people are killed. Hundreds of buildings are destroyed. And riots are going to spread to other cities in the years to follow. Many African Americans began to question the use of nonviolence. In fact, there starts to be calls to use black violence to counter white violence. Most famously, Malcolm X joins the Nation of Islam and he emphasized black nationalism, self-improvement, and separatism. So you have the radicalization of some segments of the civil rights movement. Malcolm X will unfortunately will be assassinated in 1965 by members of the Nation of Islam, but other groups are going to pop up. You have the leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Stokely Carmichael, who's really going to call for black power, economic power for African Americans, racial separatism, and you have in Oakland, California, a group of people called the Black Panthers, founded by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. Once again, this radicalization of the movement is very oftentimes calling for self-rule for African Americans. They were much more militant, and as a result, they say, Nonviolent protests are not the best path to full equality. It's important to keep in mind that all of these events are taking place at the same time the U.S. involvement in Vietnam is increasing. In 1954, while President Eisenhower was still in office, the French lose the Battle of Dien Bien Phu and abandon Vietnam. The U.S. was giving lots of money to France in their effort to recolonize Vietnam. Following the French removal, the U.S. involvement increases under President Eisenhower. We continue to give support to the unpopular leader because he was non-communist of South Vietnam named Diem. There's Eisenhower and Diem shaking some hands. When Kennedy takes office in 1961, he continues to increase and escalate U.S. involvement. Military advisors are sent into the South to protect the Diem regime. The regime continues to become unpopular. Diem is assassinated. And when Johnson takes power, you have an event, a really important event in 1964 called the Gulf of Tonkin Incident. LBJ claims the U.S. ship was attacked by North Vietnamese in the Gulf of Tonkin. There are huge questions as to whether or not that attack even took place. And the Gulf of Tonkin incident leads to Congress issuing a blank check for LBJ to send ground troops into Vietnam. And we begin the bulk of the fighting in South Vietnam against the communist forces. For three years, the U.S. public was told that the war was going well, that the war was almost over, and in 1968, during the Tet Offensive, a surprise attack by North Vietnam into the South during the Vietnamese New Year shocks the American public because it reveals the war is nowhere near being over, and the government was, in fact, misleading the American people. Anti-war protests intensifies even more so after 1968. There was already questions about the war before, but Tet just increases those questions. And really important point to keep in mind when studying the 60s is there's a variety of movements emerging during this period. The Vietnam War deeply divided the nation between hawks who were pro-war and doves who are anti-war. The war also distracted and took away funds from the Great Society and really ruins the presidency of Lyndon Johnson, and you have huge anti-war protests taking place, especially on college campuses. In fact, on college campuses such as UC Berkeley, you have the free speech movement developing, you have groups like the Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, they issued the Port Huron Statement, and other new left movements spread across college campuses as many people began joining the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and a variety of movements taking place. Betty Friedan, remember, wrote the book The Feminine Mystique, and later on she would help co-found the National Organization for Women Now. Her group and others would campaign for an equal rights amendment. It eventually get defeated in the early 70s, but you have the rise of the feminist and the women's rights movement in American society. And in 1969, you have the Stonewall riots when police harassing gay patrons of a place called Stonewall resists, and the Stonewall riots gave rise to the modern gay rights movement in American society. 
You're also going to have other movements amongst Latinos, American Indians, and Asian Americans as they also begin to demand social and economic equality. All right, everyone, that's a real quick overview of a very complex time in American history. Make sure you do your reading. Check out my other videos. If the video helped you, click like. Peace.